roundup of space. Um, very welcome to you guys. How are you doing? Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> awesome. Good end, to see you. Guys end again. of summer. <laughs> it is the end of summer roundup. Um, hope you guys are doing well. Thank you for tuning in. Um, and thank you for everyone joining us on YouTube. Just to let you guys know, today's session is pre-recorded. So please do let um, us know any questions or comments you have in the comment section below. And hopefully Nick and Terry uh, will see them at some point and we'll try and answer them in the next roundup. Um, for now, I'll hand you over to Nick and Terry. I hope you guys enjoy this one. Cool. Uh, nice to be here. As, as I said, we're doing a bit of a prereq. Um, it's only because of clashes with other things that are going on. We're both extremely busy. Um, but we thought we'd kind of start off with something quite funky and fun. Um, this one has been on the kind of back burner for quite some time. Um, NASA, obviously, they've got a helicopter on its way to Mars. Um, people may not know about this mission, but this this has been in planning oh, pretty much for almost a decade now, but it's come back into the news again, so we thought we'd hi kind of highlight it. Um, this is the Titan Kraken submarine. So, uh, the Cassini-Huygens mission, um, which is still the farthest landing of any human-made object in history, um, when the Huygens spacecraft um, descended through Titan's atmosphere and landed. Um, remarkable mission, lots of British uh, involvement in that some years ago now. Um, and they got some really impressive video that when it was finally compiled, showing you the descent through the Titan atmosphere. What it was shown was not only the kind of dendritic channels and these kind of methane channels and lots of kind of flow runoff on the surface of Titan, and there's been evidence of dunes and all sorts. They also proved that there were methane lakes. And this is something that the orbiters, the Cassini orbiter, and even Earth observations have been able to show for quite some time now. So... Uh, uh, a team led by uh, an old friend of mine, a guy called Ralph Lorenz, has been working on this concept for a submarine for quite some time. Uh, and the idea is, and this is, it sounds really crazy and it really is, they're going to try and put a one ton submarine into the Kraken Lake on Titan. Now, this lake is a thousand kilometers kind of across. It's a, it's a big lake. They've estimated, obviously, there's no detailed bathymetry yet, but they've estimated it's around about 300 meters deep. Now, you think, well, okay, designing a submarine. It's not that complex. We've had submarines now for a good few hundred years, almost since the Civil War times. But this is a submarine that has to survive in a hydrocarbon methane lake, basically at about almost 200 degrees below freezing. So this is this is going to be a challenge. This is going to be a real technical challenge. This thing's got to land. So it's got to get through Titan's atmosphere. It's got to get there first. So obviously, you're going to need a really big rocket to launch a one ton spacecraft that's a submarine. Uh, from Earth, get it out to Saturn, which is going to take several years to get, put it into Saturn orbit, then put it into Titan orbit. Then what they're estimating is going to be needed here is the DARPA X-37. Now, if you've not seen the X-37, the X-37 is like a miniature space shuttle. It's an autonomous space shuttle that's kind of regularly goes up into uh, low Earth orbit and spends several years there. And it's all top secret. Nobody's supposed to know about it, but every amateur astronomer in the world is able to image it. And this submarine then is going to descend in this X-37. Now, if anyone remembers Steve Austin in the 1970s, the $6 million man, it's kind of those flying wings. It's, it looks like one of those. Come through Titan's atmosphere and then basically deploy into a lake. Once it's done that, it's then got to have, you know, transmitters, transponders, basically transmit all of its data back to Earth or to an orbiter, uh, and then descend into Titan's Kraken Lake. It's going to be an astonishingly technically difficult challenge. Um, I work for a company that designs submarines um, as part of what a part of what we do. And we got some of our submarine design engineers to look at it. And they were like, this is a fantastic spacecraft. You know, the science mission on it, what they're in, aiming to do is fantastic, but it's not going to work as a submarine. And that was kind of our conclusion. We sent that over to, to various people who are working on the project and never heard anything back. But um, essentially, um, it's it's one of those crazy ideas. And you think what they're doing with the helicopter on Mars, if you think that's crazy, this is a whole nother level of crazy. Um, I don't know what you think, Terry, but I, I love the audacity of this. Absolutely, yes. Uh, it's a case of nothing ventured, nothing gained. The thing about Titan is it's an amazing world. It's the second biggest moon in the solar system, second only to Ganymede. It's quite the same size as Mercury, so it's, it's a very significant body. And as you say, it's fascinating because of uh, not only the, the methane and ethane lakes, but there are uh, hydrocarbons in the atmosphere, which are precursors to life. So there's a possibility that, in fact, there could be two separate ecosystems uh, on Titan, one in the atmosphere, 
uh, with the, the methane and ethane uh, are in the liquid um, lakes, although you know, very, very low temperatures. But also, there's a, some supposition that there may be a, a liquid water lake down below that, below the surface. So uh, Titan is really one of those worlds that is absolutely worth uh, exploring. So as I say, uh, uh, it's an amazingly adventurous and bold concept, but it's very, very much worth doing. Of course, with the time delay between, for signals between the Earth and, and Saturn, you're talking about everything being absolutely autonomous. And uh, that, of course, has its own problems. Yeah, I mean, that was the thing with Huygens. They only had a, quite a limited battery life on that. So they were only transmitting for, you know, a, a few hours in effect. Uh, and they got a phenomenal amount of data out of, it, out of that, you know, tiny little lander during the yeah. course of those few hours. With this, they're aiming to basically dive, submerge, you know, submerge, scan the subsurface, uh, scan the, scan the uh, lake floor, as it were, um, get image data. Obviously, people want to see what it looks like under there. So that's going to be interesting with the light levels that are going to ex experience, because the light levels obviously are very low relative to you you know, anything closer to the Earth. Um, it's a good point there with Titan. Titan is almost like an Earth analog, but a lot colder. You've got the triple point on Earth, which basically allows us to have water in the various states, as gaseous state, obviously as rain, as clouds, you know, as ice, as liquid water on our oceans. Obviously, with Titan, you've got a very similar thing with what's happening with methane, where you've got methane snow, you've got you know, these dendritic channels, as I said, forming these kind of almost like river runoffs from the land. And then this kind of these set of lakes all over all over the surface of the moon. As you said, it's a huge moon. Um, it's one of those things that people think in a billion or so years when the sun starts to expand and warm up and gets a lot bigger, obviously in two to three billion years, it's going to be one of those places where we might want to think about living, um, which was quite an amusing um, thought uh, that I heard at a talk a few years ago. But it, it is a really, really audacious mission. And you've got to wish them luck. It's not going to be 2040, I think they're estimating for this to, to finally get there if it actually gets off the ground because it's it's up against some pretty stiff competition with NASA. Uh, it's not funded yet, uh, but it's a pretty strong contender. And yeah. of course, they have their Dragonfly, the, the eight uh, rotor copter due to go in 2026. Uh, so that'll be flying around in the atmosphere. Um, of course, the submarine, I presume, will have to come up to the surface to beam data up to an orbiter, and the orbiter will then have to send that back to Earth. I, yeah. I don't know the details of yet, but that seems to be the only way to do it. So it's an incredibly complex mission, but they've had a very good success with Cassini, as you say. Well, it's it's interesting in that Huygens was able to transmit directly back to Earth. The, the power of the transmitter, even on the Huygens spacecraft, was capable of being picked up by the Deep Space Network from Earth. So, And the size of the transmitters, you can see kind of part of the uh, design on the image there. And part of the transmission system, they, they theoretically could transmit directly back to Earth without an orbiter. An orbiter is going to give them a lot more capability, though, in terms yeah. of being able to do a relay and capture data. Should anything go wrong with any of the primary transmitters, and they've got that backup in orbit. So I think this is this is one to keep an eye on. As you said, not directly funded yet. They funded some research studies. If Dragonfly is a success, I think this one may get the go-ahead, yeah, because it is one of those worlds that... <clears throat> It really needs a revisit. I'm hoping Neptune and a few of us are going to get a revisit as well, but it's going to be interesting. Which yeah. brings us back nicely to uh, a bit closer to home with Rocket Labs. Um, Peter Beck's team down in New Zealand, um, US based company Rocket Labs, return to flight. I know you're excited about this, Terry. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's a case of if at first you don't succeed, try and try again. They did have actually quite a number of successes. And then uh, about a month ago, they had an unfortunate failure just after launch when there's an, an anomaly and everything shut down and the mission was lost and all the, the payload and so on. But um, the only way to do it is to learn from the mistakes, uh, try again, and they've just had a successful launch. Um, it's very interesting that they're doing that from New Zealand. That could be regarded as a sort of a, a, a southern hemisphere analog of uh, our efforts here in, in the northern hemisphere in, uh, say, northern Scotland or Shetland, where you can launch for polar orbit. Uh, they're fairly close, not quite as close as we are uh, to the South Pole, but it's a good sight. It's excellent to see them um, literally sort of getting back into work again, sorting out the problems and getting a successful launch. And it looks good for them for the future. Yeah, absolutely. I'd say one of the great lessons from this, it's like it's taken them a month to basically recover, work out what the anomaly was and just say, right, let's get on with it. And you only wish that a lot of the other space agencies would take the same approach. SpaceX do. SpaceX, they blow stuff up all the time. They just carry on. 
they don't care. They just carry on and on. And that's the kind of mindset that we had in the early 1960s with NASA, with the, you know, the Kaputnik and everything else that was happening. And we yeah. were blowing up stuff all the time. And I think it, it's almost like the, the notion of space, everybody says space and it's like, ooh, Darth Vader and space stations and, you know, all of this. It's not. It's an engineering challenge. It's like building a submarine or building an aircraft carrier or building a plane. If a plane falls out of the sky, we don't suspend all flights across the world unless you're Boeing. Um, and that was, you know, for various other reasons as well. Well, if you, <laughs> well yeah, two flights and they lied about it. But anyway, moving on from that. Um, if, you know, for car crashes, you don't stop all cars. It's yeah. if an air, you know, if a ship, you know, sinks, you don't suspend all ships. You basically, with space, we've really got to get over this mindset of if something goes wrong, we've got to have a two year, three year inquiry period. Things yeah. are going to go wrong. If we're planning on launching hundreds of tourists into space with, you know, the likes of SpaceX and Jeff Bezos with Blue Origin and all these other Virgin Galactic, people are going to die make no mistake about it accidents will happen they've already happened with virgin galactic you know during the last one of the last test flights things are going to happen things are going to go wrong and if we take the approach of right okay what can we learn let's move on let's move on quickly then we will advance otherwise mm -hmm. we're going to be stuck in almost like the dark ages and nobody really wants to see that the thing is this as well they, they're planning some really big things at, at rocket labs they're planning on like he helicopter um helo as we call them uh in the defense sector but helicopter kind of retrieval um and yeah i think this, this is the 14th flight i think that electron um, the rocket labs mission uh team have, have performed and i think towards the end of this year they're going to try and recovery of, of the fairing stages as well from yeah. the ocean and then yeah. eventually a helicopter recovery that's going to be an interesting challenge and obviously in the 1960s this was done with top secret payloads before the days of digital photography you'd have satellites you know hovering over russia and china taking yeah. film photographs and then dropping them back through the atmosphere and then being caught by planes uh, in midair which was quite a, an amazing technical challenge at the time and that i think is what they, they're going for now it's going to be viable i think it's going to be really interesting in scotland given the the uh, wind uh, that you get and the jet stream that's going to be a, a really cracking challenge but it, it's again one to watch and i really do yeah. like what rocket labs are doing but anyway moving on even closer <laughs> to home and we're getting into really scary territory now so terry and i have both got a bit of a passion for uh, asteroids and comets and what have you uh, we've got a few close flow flybys haven't we terry yeah, the one that particularly interests me is one of the uh, the closest of the big ones. Now, big is a relative term. This isn't as big as the, the asteroids that you can see in your telescope, but it's much, much bigger, for example, than the one that exploded over Chelyabinsk. And it's due actually at 1612, its closest approach, 1712 summertime on September the 1st. So that's about as topical as it could be. And it's going to come to within a third of the distance of the moon, or just under 100,000 kilometers, 99,580 kilometers to be precise. Now, it's about 30 uh, meter diameter, say roughly 100 feet. That's not a dinosaur killer. But if that were to uh, impact over any major city, it would be absolutely horrendous. So it's a definite miss, but it's close and it's sort of too close for comfort. If that thing was heading for us, we would be in absolute disaster uh, emergency mode, trying to uh, sort of work out how to save as many people as possible. It's going to pass us at 8.2 kilometers per second. That's not as fast as some, but that is flipping fast. And the, uh, the impact um, energy is not only the size and the, the density of the body, but it goes up to the square of the velocity. So 8.2 kilometers per second is a heck of a lot faster than anything we ever see here on Earth. That thing was to hit us, it would be really serious. But don't be, as they say in another program, don't be having nightmares. It is going to miss, but it's close. And it just shows us how important it is to keep monitoring these things because sooner or later, a substantial sized one will be heading our way and we need to be able to deal with it. Absolutely. And this one is called 2011 ES4. I mean, it's yeah. as, as Terry said, it's a third of the Earth-Moon distance. And you think, well, that's quite far away, but it's not. 
And, you know, the one that hit Chelyabinsk and airburst over Chelyabinsk was 17 metres wide. So this is almost double the size of that. And the thing, you know, at 8.2 kilometres per second, um, there's a very neat application actually online called the Impact Calculator. So you can actually work out if you put in the parameters for a 30 metre wide asteroid travelling at 8.2 kilometres per second, this would literally wipe out most major cities yeah. on Earth. And if it were to hit London, Washington, New York, etc., you'd be looking at a million people as, as casualties. So, and this isn't particularly big. And we've got three of these things in the next four weeks, basically buzzing the Earth, obviously at different distances, some of them further than the moon, some of them are like this one closer. Um, it really does highlight the fact that we need to keep our eyes on the sky, but not just our eyes. We need to get technology now really ramping up to work out what we're going to do about this. Because Whilst the European Space Agency with their Diddy Moss, Diddy Moon impactor, it's a really neat idea. It's a tiny little thing that they're going to hit Diddy Moon um, and see what, you know, what they can do in terms of deflection. Something on this scale, and this isn't even that big, as Terry said. It's, we're not talking dinosaur killers here. We're not talking the 10 to 15 kilometer wide one that would literally wipe out most life on Earth. But we do need to work out what we're going to do about this. And there are technical ways around it, but I'll just keep leaving it to these engineers and scientists to, to argue it and discuss it and have UN meetings and basically get nowhere, which is where we've got for about the last 50 years in terms of having to deal with this as a real problem. We can see them now. There's a much better budget for seeing them. And after the debacle a few years ago of cancelling everything in the Southern Hemisphere with the sky surveys, um, thankfully that's now being restored a little bit. Uh, we're going to have radio telescopes like the SKA and various other things online able to detect loads more of these hopefully in the coming years and some of the large synoptic sky surveys and various others but we need to keep on this it's that simple if yeah. we don't then <laughs> one day it's gonna it's gonna yeah. come and bite us the interesting thing about this one as the name implies it was discovered back in 2011 yep. and we've been monitoring it ever since um but it's the ones that we only find out just sort of a, a matter of months before they're coming that are the ones that are we really need to worry about. So we need to keep looking at the sky, discovering these things, looking out for ones that are heading our way and having a plan to deal with them. Well, absolutely. You only have to look at Comet Neowise, which was graced in Northern Hemisphere skies, is now doing a nice job in the Southern Hemisphere, although fading, um, which was only discovered a few months ago in yeah. kind of cosmological timescales. If that had been coming our way, we'd have only discovered it, you know, when we discovered it and it was heading Earth's direction, that would have been it. I mean, game over. Yeah. So yeah. we really, really, really do need to put, and I can't emphasize this strongly enough, which brings us back on to the next topic, which is the value of Earth observation. As Monty Python uh, once famously said in The Life of Brian, what did the Romans ever do for us? What did space ever do for us? And this is a really interesting question that comes up all the time. Um, whenever I'm at meetings or discussions. And it's one of those things that, you, you know, the general public, it, it's an interesting question, I guess. You go to 100 people in, in the street and you say, right, who's the first person on the moon? And they'll all say Neil Armstrong. They all know who he was. And you'll say, well, who's the second person on the moon? And I say Buzz Aldrin, right? Who was the third person on the moon? And no one will know. Who was the first person on the ISS? And no one will know. Um, space to many people is kind of a bit of a mystery and it's all science fiction and Star Wars. And, you know, movies like Apollo 13 did more for advertising and promoting space pretty much than the entire space industry has done since its inception, practically, apart from the Apollo period. And it's, it's one of those things that, I think the public needs to be more aware of, especially in these grave times that we live in now with the pandemic and everyone saying, well, we need to fund science more. We need to fund scientific research more because that's how we're going to get out of this pandemic is scientific research. But the, the fact that space does so much for us, I mean, everyone who's got a mobile phone will know what space does for them because your Google Maps and your map system on your iPhone um, rely on satellite data. And you've got GPS capability in your car to be able to drive to various locations. And okay, sometimes it gets it wrong, but that is essential now. It's not only essential for you getting from yourselves to Auntie Mabel's um, in your car, it's essential for our defense, for the defense of the entire planet. You know, the armed forces rely on this. If you've got a ship sailing more than 15 to 20 kilometers off, you know, off land, it's reliant on satellite data. It's reliant on satellite communications. Um, if you want to monitor the ice sheets and how global warming is affecting us, it's satellite data that's doing that. If you're looking at water and flood modelling, the UK, before COVID hit us, we were hit by massive floods. And we need to be able to understand how these are going to impact us in the future. Rising sea levels, it's going to affect a lot of the 
low-lying islands in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific and various other locations around the world. We need to understand this. Um, plastic in the oceans, monitoring these gigantic rafts of plastic that are forming in the Pacific and the Atlantic and various other locations around the world, all coming out of like half a dozen rivers in in the Asia Pacific region, essentially. This is the kind of thing that space really does for us and, and gives us so much that we may not appreciate, but we really, really do need to understand. Um, things like solar storms, you know, we may say, oh, we've got satellites observing the sun. What, what good's that to us? Well, if a massive solar storm was to hit us, we'd lose most of the communication satellites and most of the satellites in orbit. You know, in the late uh, mid 1800s, there was a thing called the Carrington event, which was a dis gigantic solar storm that at the time the morse code telegraph system which was pretty much the only major electrical system on earth went into overdrive you know these things were automatically sending out morse code signals for hours after this thing hit in the late 80s we had a massive solar storm that took out half of canada's electrical system so we really really need to understand what this is giving to us and you only have to look at you know from a scientific research perspective you've got things like archaeology being able to do ground penetrating radar egypt the, the archaeology of egypt has been transformed by the ability of satellites to observe sites which are below the surface using thermal infrared capabilities, subsurface radar penetration capability. It's it's amazing. Rainforest degradation in the Amazon. It's it's one of those things that if you don't know what space does for you yet, you really need to understand this. Because when people put forward the argument of, oh, there's people dying and there's hunger. And yes, there is. There's all these things that we need to you know solve on the earth. I completely agree. But if you're going to cut spending on anything, look at the defense budget. The US defense budget is $667 billion per year. Now, two thirds of a trillion dollars per year spent on killing people and weaponizing things. And, you know, you only have to look at some of the aircraft like the F-35. That's $120 million per plane. You know, NASA's entire budget is about $20 billion. And that's to do everything that they do from human space flight through to you know, all these amazing missions out to Mars and various other planets. It's it's one of those things that we really need to, to start thinking about. I don't know if you've got any, I'm, I'm really passionate about this, you can probably tell, but Terry, have you got any thoughts on this? Yeah, to me, the, the main thing is the way the satellites monitor the environment, climate change, the melting of the ice caps, uh, the development of hurricanes, the forest fires in uh, California and so on. And, and even ones in areas that people don't know about, like up in Siberia, there's a huge amount of Siberia on fire at the moment. Uh, but one of the, the most amazing things is what's done for agriculture. Satellites can look at a farmer's field and say, you need more potassium in the northeast corner, or the pH value is wrong over there, or you've got a slight disease outbreak in your barley crop or whatever. Um, it is as detailed as that. And the big combine harvesters now will actually go out and harvest a field entirely automatically without anybody yep. sitting there. They will simply follow the GPS signals, which, okay, a, a sort of farmer could do it, but um, it's a lot cheaper to have it done automatically. So the benefit to farming alone, which is crucial, obviously, for our survival, I mean, with the ever-increasing population, we just need more and more food. There's another way of doing it, and that's to curtail the population, but we'll not go down that road at the moment. But agriculture is now becoming so intensive and so mechanized, and almost all the information that you get now on a large scale, and even down to fairly detailed scale, you know, a fraction of a hectare is coming from satellites. Um, not only the way your crop is growing, but what it needs when it's ready to be harvested and so on. Huge benefit to agriculture right throughout the world. Absolutely. I mean, I used to, it's funny you say that. I used to work for a company called Muddy Boots, who were basically one of the world's largest kind of food software supply chain companies. And it's not just the farm itself. You, you know, you've got tractors, as you said, that are almost autonomous, or you've got farmers sitting there with an iPad looking at what they need to spray, what, you know, pesticides mm -hmm. or whatever they need to spray at specific locations, and then autonomously harvest, which gives the farmers more time to look at other aspects of their farm. And that is going to become more and more important. As you said, the population of the world is expanding. Obviously, we've got a, a global crisis at the moment, but the population of the world continues to grow. And at the rate of its growth, you know, we, we potentially are not going to be able to feed everybody. And we don't want to end up with a, a Charlton Heston 1970s sci-fi scenario where we move into Soylent Green. And I'll let anyone watching this Google that one because it's a terrifying uh, concept. 
if you've not seen the movie Silent Green. Um, but yeah, agriculture is is so vital. But then I said that ties in so well with things like flood monitoring and water monitoring yeah. and making sure that all of our ecosystem is is watched in the level of detail that we haven't had in you know in history in human history if you think the science of meteorology for example you know if anyone's seen the the movie the aeronauts uh with james glacier that was almost laughed at in the mid 1800s and yet since then that's become so critical obviously to you know the survival of our species and and the agricultural side and climate change etc so it's one of those things that if you're not aware of what space does for you uh, and you may think it's it's kind of all fancy space rockets and spacex launching you know a thousand satellites a day um it's not there's a lot more to it but that does bring us on nicely to spacex's latest endeavors um with the grain silo from hell um so sn6 they've they've had a few mishaps but they've had a few successes and again terry i'm going to fire this on your direction because i know you're, you're a big fan of this oh well yes um i don't know what the latest is in this actually uh but the the plan is yes to to get this big green silo uh they, they had a, a flight last time which went up what a couple hundred meters or something came down again safely it's a matter of continue to develop this thing and the exciting thing in the future is this it was what's going to be taking people to mars in the future this is big uh, and you have to admire elon musk for his uh oh i don't know he seems to be absolutely unlimited in, in what he's his chutz <laughs> yeah. uh, there's nothing that he thinks is beyond his capabilities and he, as we were saying earlier with Rocket Labs, he just keeps on going and trying and trying and trying. And this thing will eventually get to Mars, I'm sure. Maybe not in my lifetime, but it'll get there. Uh, so you just have to say, yeah, keep on going. Cut out it's the Starlink satellites and constantly. <laughs> it's, it's, it. it's interesting, though, Musk in the last few weeks, I mean, obviously, SpaceX is still a, a massive thing and he's got Hyperloop uh, and obviously what he's doing with Tesla. What was also interesting, and I thought this has got long reaching implications, I think, for the future of humanity and what we're doing is his Neuralink system, where he's basically yeah. got a kind of transponder, Wi Fi transponder in. Uh, basically interfacing to the brain of a pig. Now, you may think, well, what's that got to do with spaceflight? Well, in the future, if we've got these autonomous and semi-autonomous systems and you've got this capability where you want to maximize the amount of time that you've got, for example, roving around the surface of Mars, and you've got, you know, the standard human computer interfaces at the moment, we've had the mouse since Xerox Park in the mid 1970s. We've had touch screens and tablets, you know, since the era of the iPhone and obviously before that with uh, various other developments. And it's one of those, it's almost like the next great step or the next great leap in terms of human computer interfaces. And it's one I think we really needs kind of looking at closely in terms of how we move forward. You only have to look at the interior of the SpaceX Dragon capsule. It's all touchscreens. And I had some major reservations about this. And I think everyone does have, um, because obviously you've got command override, so ground control. If there was a major issue, they could do a command override and say, okay, we're going to shut down the touchscreens. Because if you go into a spin situation where you've got astronauts potentially floating around inside the cabin anyway, and then something catastrophic happens, like um, in the Gemini mission with Dave Scott and Neil Armstrong, where the Gemini capsule went spinning completely out of control. If you've got a bunch of touchscreens everywhere, you've got a potential for disaster there where you know arms flailing about, etc. Obviously, with command override and all the other systems, it's going to be able to get around that. But if you've got something that can intrinsically link into other biometric capabilities of the human body, as it were, because you do want to send humans, you can send robots as much as you like, but until we get boots on the ground on Mars, nobody's going to be as excited as they were in 1969. It's a fact. You know, you can put as many robots on the surface of a comet or whatever as you want. People got really excited in 1969 for a reason, uh, because it was human exploration and that needs to happen again. Um, so I think it's, kind of a, a multi-pronged approach with SpaceX. And yes, Terry and I, we've said many times, we've got major issues with Starlink, still do have major issues with Starlink, yeah. even though they've now reduced the visual magnitude now so that it's almost out of sight, out of mind for the general public. Oh, we're not going to see it anymore, so it doesn't exist. For the astronomers, it's a nightmare. Absolutely. Because, you know, even my, even my backyard observatory, I can hit magnitudes of like 2021 20, easily with amateur back, backyard telescopes. You know, professional research grade telescopes can hit 24, 25, 26. These are logarithmic scale magnitudes. So if you've got a stream of Starlinks going across it, you're gonna have all of your data just trashed. So thank you, Elon, for making them not visible to the public, but 
you've not solved the problem by any stretch of the imagination. The other issue now that for that's becoming more and more important is all these new developments with very wide field, deep uh, astrophotography or, or imaging. And, you know, if, if you're just concentrating one tiny little area of the sky, there's a good chance there'll be no satellites going through it. But if you're imaging a couple of square degrees and down to magnitude 25 or 26, there's going to be hundreds of these things passing across. It's going to be a nightmare. It's going to look like, the, if you remember the, the early 80s movie Tron with the light cycles, it's going to look like the light cycle grid. You're yeah. going to have great big streams going across in all sorts of wonderful kind of uh, linear directions. Anyway, um, it's too depressing to think about yeah, what, yeah. what's happening with that. But in terms of what he's doing with the Falcon Heavy, Falcon 9, with Starship, etc., all power to the man. It's, it's brilliant to watch. Um, let's just hope it continues come November and, you know, we don't get any kind of presidential funding changes, hopefully, when we get a new incumbent in at the White House. But we'll see. See what happens there. Anyway, moving back a bit closer to home in terms of what we do um there's some really interesting stuff coming up in the sky um over the coming month we're going to touch on one major one at the moment which is moon and mars in terms of conjunction mars is becoming more and more visible um there's some remarkable images already coming out of people like anthony wesley down in australia damien peach and his uh incredible imaging as per usual um and also now with software and really advanced camera capabilities even on amateur telescopes the quality of the images that we're seeing from Mars has been spectacular, being able to see Olympus Mons easily. And Mars isn't even in a great position at the moment, uh, relative in the UK anyway, in terms of altitude um, in the sky. But it's it's one of those things that it makes for great viewing. Anyway, Terry, what do you, what's your yeah. thoughts on this? Yeah, uh, Mars can be a little bit disappointing if you just look at it through a telescope. Uh, it doesn't have very high contrast like the craters and mountains on the moon and so on. But you can see some of the major features. You can see the polar caps and so on. But as you say now, uh, even with an amateur telescope, perhaps even just putting your smartphone up to the eyepiece of a decent telescope, you can get amazing images now. But for a lot of people, you know, they don't even, maybe even have a telescope and they maybe don't even know where Mars is in the sky. So you have an excellent opportunity on the early morning of September the 6th when the moon will pass very, very close to it. It'll be getting closer to it just as the, uh, the dawn is starting to break. And at its very closest, it will be less than its own diameter, just about half a degree away from Mars. And as you say, Mars is now getting really bright. Uh, at the moment, I think Jupiter probably just slightly has the edge on it in terms of uh, objects in a, in a dark sky. Venus, of course, is brighter still and it, it rises later on. But on the morning of September the 6th, you won't be able to mistake Mars. You, if you've never seen it before, it's a really bright planet and it'll be just above the moon. Uh, my friends down in the southwest of Ireland will get the best view of all because the sun rises later there. And they'll see it actually under half a degree away from the moon just before the sky gets too bright. Uh, other things coming up, there was a lot of interest uh, at the end of um, sort of last season and early into, into this year about Betelgeuse, the bright uh, red supergiant oh, star yes. in Orion. And now Orion went more or less behind the sun as far as we see it here from Earth. Uh, the northern part of it anyway, where Betelgeuse is. Well, if you're up early in the morning now, <clears throat> the northern part of Orion, where uh, Betelgeuse is starting to come up above the horizon. Uh, so have a look and see if Betelgeuse is still bright. Uh, is it nearly as bright as, um, say, Aldebaran and Taurus? Or is it faint? You'll not see Rigel coming up until a bit later. Well, have a look. Uh, as far as we know, it's back to its normal brightness. But who knows? It's a fascinating star. And it's one of those ones that will sometime in the not too distant future astronomically speaking go supernova so that's the main interest absolutely and you know if we go on to what not to miss that is probably one of the things not to miss in the coming months um obviously now we're at the end of summer we're approaching the winter months so the the things that you should be looking up for right now i mean the pleiades is always great and it's going to be rising in taurus yeah. as, as terry was saying uh, beetlejuice what was interesting i think about beetlejuice is the hubble information that they got from it in terms of seeing being this expanding gas cloud turning into dust and dimming Betelgeuse to such an extent that basically for, for months people were saying, is it going to go supernova? Is it, well, 
call it probably it is going to go supernova it could be tomorrow it could be in a million years we don't know we we just know it's going to go supernova it's it you know at the end of its life what's interesting as well though and we'll probably touch on this next time because uh, it's an evolving story astronomers have recently discovered a star that vanished so yeah. This has been kind of monitored for quite some time. And typically at the end of a star's life cycle, um, if it's above a certain mass, it'll eventually, um, it'll, the, the way up battle between gravity and the nuclear forces will either go one way or the other, and the star will either go poof and form a great big planetary nebula and something like the Dumbbell Nebula, which looks really beautiful, or it will go supernova like the Crab Nebula, and you'll get this massive supernova explosion. Um, now, typically, that's what happens with stars. What astronomers have found quite recently is a star that didn't do this. It just simply vanished, and they think it may have gone into a core collapse supernova, um, or, sorry, a core collapse black hole type state, yeah. where essentially it's gone past the super supernova part and it's just gone okay i'm just going to collapse down on myself and vanish so it's a really interesting and i think evolving story at the moment in terms of how they're going to detect this and it's also some of the research that's going on now for planet nine or planet 10 as it used to be but planet nine now because obviously since the demotion of pluto and something is still causing a gravitational anomaly out in the Kuiper Belt area. And astronomers are still looking for that elusive, what is it out there that's causing this? And one of the theories was that it was almost like a grapefruit-sized black hole, yep. um, kind of miniature black hole out. Or, and I, I'm not a big fan of this idea, but it's really interesting that there is something out there. It is causing some weird gravitational, gravitational perturbations out there. So I think these evolving stories, hopefully we'll touch on these next time, but uh, I think think there it, it's always good to look up Betelgeuse is one of those stars that you kind of almost take for granted it's in Orion you know everyone knows Orion it's one of the most famous constellations it's one of those stars that it's just there but after its behavior over the last season it's one of those ones definitely to keep an eye on you're right yeah absolutely I mean that it, it is a variable star but it had never been as dim as faint as it was in um, the early part of this year so it caught everybody by surprise. And as you're mentioning the Hubble Space Telescope there, well, the amazing thing about that, even though it's, what, 450 light years away, some colossal distance, it was able to detect actually something in the southern hemisphere of the star. It was able to resolve detail on a star. OK, it's a big star, but it's a heck of a long way away. So it just shows you what the HST can do. Absolutely amazing. No, it's amazing. And if we get the James Webb in the next few years, yeah. I mean, again, the resolution on that especially in the uh, infrared end of the spectrum we're potentially going to be able to resolve real detail on nearby stars in terms of you know we see sunspots on our own on our own sun obviously quite clearly because it's only 93 million miles away but being able to resolve star spots in, with real detail because they've been able to kind of do this for, for quite some time now with the likes of the hubble and some of the larger telescopes like keck etc but it's going to become more of a thing and Direct imaging of exoplanets we're already doing, but directly imaging detail. Could you imagine being able to get real detail on an exoplanet? Um, if any kind of level, even to the level that we were previously before New Horizons getting on Pluto, where we've got some kind of changes in albedo, and being able to look at the atmospheres with spectroscopes, um, it's going to, the next 10, 15 years is going to be yeah. absolutely revolutionary in astronomy. So it's one of those hobbies that if you've not got a telescope yet, get one. Um, yeah. If you've got kids, get them a telescope it's one of those hobbies that unlike your xbox or your playstation or any of these games consoles that the kids are glued to all the time it's one of those things that once you've got the telescope yes you can spend an absolute fortune and get more and more telescopes and bigger and bigger telescopes etc but you can just sit out in your back garden and enjoy what is nature's most phenomenal light show every every single night when it's clear yeah. so definitely one to do yeah absolutely the, the amazing thing again about um Orion is that at opposite corners, you have this incredibly bright uh, blue white giant star Rigel. And then on the, the top left corners, we now have, you've got this incredibly red uh, super giant Betelgeuse. So it's a brilliant contrast. And then you have the lovely three stars in the straight line and the belt in between. So we'll so, say more about uh, Orion, I'm sure, later in the year. Absolutely. It's one of the only nebula as well. If you, if you yeah. 
you are interested in like seeing something other than a star or you know a planet um you can look at the orion the belt of orion and just below the belt you've got the sword of orion and even with modest binoculars in a good dark sky location you can see this kind of cloud this gaseous cloud the orion nebula it's a star forming region this is a stellar nursery and new stars are being born there all the time some of the detailed images that are coming out of the hubble are incredible and if you look at the belt of orion the three stars the one to the left Murfak, basically just below that uh, Altenac, sorry. Just below that, you've got the Horsehead Nebula. You can't yeah. really see that unless you've got a really big telescope and you've got a really good uh, dark sky. But even a modest telescope with a, a half-decent camera, you'll start to see this. And the Horsehead Nebula is one of those. It's a, it's an amazing thing when you see it for the first time because it yeah. literally looks like a horse's head, this kind yeah. of dark dust um, against the, the nebulous region. It's it's really beautiful. It's one of those things that, yeah, we'll definitely talk more about in the, in the coming shows. Anyway... On that note, I think we're pretty much out of time. Um, but like I said, this is a pre-record, um, but we will be online, uh, both Terry and myself, tomorrow. So if anyone's got any questions via the YouTube or Twitter, um, please don't be afraid to ask us. We're more than happy to answer any questions. Um, we'll see you again in a couple of weeks' time. Um, it's been really enjoyable. Thanks again to the Space Store team um, for helping us. And all they've, they've got some fancy new t tech and kit, which they're really excited about, some really new um, fancy graphics capabilities, new cameras new microphones so definitely stay tuned to the space store in terms of their additional broadcast because they're doing all sorts of great outreach and stem all through this pandemic this is part of what we not terry and i are trying to do uh, with these regular news broadcasts is really enhance the, the stem and outreach of it and uh, we'll see you in a, in a few weeks and as we always say it's good night from me and good night from me bye Brilliant. Thank <laughs> you. cheers see you. thank you so much nick and terry um I'll just say one, one big thank you to everyone who's tuning in um, on Tuesday night to watch this talk. Um, as Nick alluded to, we'll be back in two weeks' time on the 15th. So please do tune, us, tune, us in, tune, tune in then. Um, until then, stay safe and keep watching. Bye. Adios, amigos. Bye. 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 Bye.